Thank you. First off, thank you for allowing me to be here and having a few moments to share some of my thoughts, some of my experiences. I want to spend the next 25 or so minutes talking about embracing a zero trust architecture, how we're going to have to let go some of the things of the past, uh, our past thinking, some of our past doing, forgetting about the wonderful things that we've done in the past as they're not going to be enough or they're not going to be the right things as we head into the future of computing and technology. We truly do need to shift and embrace the, the future of technology. Now, I admit and I agree we don't need to forget everything. I've spent 25 years building security programs. I'm not throwing that all out, but I am saying I can't simply rely on that. We can't rely on yesterday's technologies and ways of doing everything we've always done to continue to protect us. We need to start shifting our thoughts, start shifting some of the solution to the ways of the future, which I believe is a zero trust model. So as this slide indicates, my name is Benjamin Coral. I am a CISO for Zscaler. What that allows me to do is focus on building strategic programs that address the common threats that most organizations are facing. I get to partner with other organizations, take a look at their security controls, make recommendations on how we can partner together, work together, and really thwart the cyber threats that, again, other organizations are facing. This comes after spending the last 25 or so years building security programs in what I'm now calling the traditional way. It's just the way we all did it. It's the way things were done back then. I just don't think it's the way of the future. So I'm now advocating for a shift, a shift towards a new architecture. Really quick agenda here, not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this, but I really want to touch on what I see as one of the problems of today that organizations are facing. We'll talk about how we solve those problems using yesteryear's solutions. And then we'll talk about why those solutions are no longer effective, if we believe they were ever really effective at all. And then we'll spend the rest of the presentation talking about a new approach, uh, some of the options that are out there for us. And this is where I'm going to share my experiences, what I've done, why I've done it, and what some of my thoughts are. And if by some small miracle, we still have some time left. I do have an example of a common threat and how a fully implemented zero trust architecture can help defend against that, that common threat. And for this presentation, I chose ransomware as that threat. So if we really have time at the end, we might be able to dive into that one as well. So, all right, without further ado, let's talk about what I'm seeing as one of the problems that we have. And the problem is technology has changed, absolutely has. The way we built or architected our infrastructures from when I started in the, in the industry, it's changed. With the advanced technologies, with migrations to the cloud, things have had to change. They've had to adapt. This wasn't some novel new thing that we were all forced into, this cloud migration, this SaaS adoption, this migration in 2020 when COVID hit and we had to send all our administrative users working from home. That really wasn't the start of cloud adoption. My previous organization, we had started our cloud adoption back in 2017. So by the time 2020 hit, we had already largely enabled our administrative employees to be working remotely. So by that point, I had already seen that the old controls, they were no longer effective. And uh, what I mean by that is something as simple as a password change. A password change still required our employees to connect to the network or else we just told them, hey, yeah, I know you're working from home today. Don't reset your password when you're at home. When you're back in the office tomorrow, go ahead and reset it. If simple things like that and password changes, or I'm sorry, uh, pushing patches and stuff, those were the simple things. Those controls, they just weren't, weren't working in a cloud-centric and a work-from-anywhere type of environment. And I know that my organization was not unique in that. The problem with our technologies, the controls that we've always put out there, 
is like this slide indicates, you had that, that castle uh, with a moat that was around it. Today, I cannot build a strong enough wall to keep all of the attackers out. And the main reason for this is I don't have a centralized place or using that analogy, a castle keep that I can put all my valuables in and build my defenses around. My users are no longer sitting at corporate locations. They're nearly as distributed as the data itself is. Our controls, they simply cannot keep up using that, that traditional model. And aside from that, attackers themselves have evolved. They've improved their, their tools. They've improved their techniques, the processes, the way they go about attacking us. They're good. They have organized. They run their exploits as a business. You have DDoS as a service or distributed denial as a service. You've got ransomware as a service. These aren't just businesses. These are big businesses. Organized crime has adapted. They've changed. They've always followed the money. So it should be no surprise to us that they've adopted the digital frontier and are an ever-present threat to unprotected or insufficiently protected organizations. And this doesn't even take into account state-sponsored adversaries. When I started in IT back in the mid-90s, our security stack consisted of two things, antivirus on your desktop and an IP filtering solution, such as IP tables or a router with an access control list. That was sufficient in the 90s, maybe, but it's not sufficient today. We can't rely on the same solutions from yesterday and hope that they're going to be enough to combat today's threats. And they're certainly not going to be enough to combat tomorrow's threats. If we think we can simply do the status quo and keep things the same, we will realize that we, the defenders, the guardians of our infrastructures, of our organizations, will become irrelevant. And worse, our organizations are going to become breached and then we're going to be ousted. We're going to be thrown out. And if we refuse to change, we should be thrown out as well. So what do I see that's causing some of this problem? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about all of the different buzzwords that are on this screen, but what I really want to do is touch on a couple of them. The reality is we have had to adapt because technology has seen exponential growth. It really has. The advancements of automation, you see machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, maybe it hasn't advanced as much as we would like, as much as some have hoped. I really was hoping that some of this automation would help my, my SOC teams, my security operations teams be more efficient. But the thing that AI and ML still lack right now is human intuition. Now, that could also be a great thing because it doesn't have intuition means my job is safe for now, which is good because I don't plan to retire just yet. But those technologies certainly are advancing. And then we've got data and we've got big data, which leads to data science. Data science wasn't a field when I started in IT a long, long time ago, but I can't think of a type of business that would not or doesn't right now benefit from having a data science team, a team that's able to collect, process, make use of that data in order to make better data-driven decisions going into the future. That's, that's truly is priceless. But if data truly is the new oil, as one of the analogies goes, then we've got to protect that data. The problem is that data is in so many places. Back to my castle analogy on the last slide, where is our data? It could be in the cloud, a public cloud, a private cloud. It could be on-prem. It's going to be on our employees' laptops. It's going to be on our employees' phones, which is going to be in their pocket and goes everywhere that they go. Our data is everywhere. Do we know where it's at? If you look at the oil analogy of data is that new oil, look at the oil companies such as Shell or BP. They know where their data is. They're constantly looking for it. They're looking for new places where oil is going to be. Why are we, the defenders, not doing the same thing, understanding where our data is? It's valuable. Our businesses run on data. They run on data and they run on trust. And if we lose our data, we're going to lose the trust. And then our businesses are no longer going to stay in business. 
yet not everything is going to be brand spanking new as well our attackers are getting better the cyber criminals are adapting they're changing they're evolving they're getting better but they're also using the old tactics malware has been around for nearly 40 years back with the morse worm and everything been around ransomware is malware our controls really are not stopping it so once again we can talk about the controls our defense in depth we've deployed a lot of different tools but it's not truly protecting us it's not protecting our employees our employees now are the most technologically competent than they've ever been. They are very comfortable with technology, but they still fall for social engineering because the cyber criminals are really good at engaging and putting these phishing messages together. We still fall for them. The right message at the right time, the right circumstances, and each and every one of us is going to click. So we've got to do better. So those are some of the things that are causing the problem. And our technology stacks, as much as we built defense in depth, still aren't helping us. How have we solved some of those issues in the past? We built based on the analogy of, of a castle and moat. We used our legacy technologies that were out there and we threw more tools. And every tool that we threw out added complexity. So more tools, more complexity. But in yesteryear, we solved security by trying to put all of our marbles in one place. And then we built those walls around them. We built our protections, our monitoring, uh, our responses all around those controls. It was the old hard shell with the mushy inside analogy. We put all our efforts into making the network very hard to penetrate. But once you got in, there was very little, if anything, to stop anybody from accessing everything else. That's one of the main reasons that these, these controls in the old way has failed us. It had an inherent trust. Once you were inside, you were trusted. It was an us versus them mentality. Once you got entry, you were trusted. Again, inherent trust. That, that's a bad thing. And then whenever new attacks came out, we would say how the way to figure out how we're going to solve this new problem is a new piece of technology a new technology stack a lot of times it was that new tool it's like walking the floor of rsa i'm sure each and every one of us at some point in our career has gone to rsa and walked around that vendor floor where you literally have thousands of vendors hawking their wares all promising to solve a problem Unfortunately, they're just making the overall problem worse and they're adding more complexity because a new tool, a new appliance creates more logs feeding into my SIM. Somebody's got to do something with all of those logs. It just added complexity. The problem is attackers have had decades to learn how to get past these technologies. So thinking we can do the same thing over and over again, and this time we're going to be successful, I think, Think that either teeters on insanity or just not naivety. The problem again, as well, not again, as well, is these, these solutions, these technology stacks, they don't scale. We're having to deploy these technology stacks at every location where our data is at. The problem is our data, our data is in thousands of locations now. I don't have one single data center one location where that data is at because our data is going to sit everywhere that our users are at it's going to sit in the cloud it's going to sit in SaaS solutions we can't put that stack everywhere that our data sits anymore this looks like a little bit of a busy slide and i promise i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but i spent my career utilizing this as my network or i guess i started in token ring so when I went to the, the hub and spoke, that was actually an upgrade for me. But we've got, you know, we've got the hub and spoke networks. We have that castle emote, which is, you see my castle on the last couple of slides. But the problem with this is it brings all connections back to a central point. And then decisions there are going to be made by switch or it's going to be made by a firewall. So it relies on amazing network people to be able to properly configure a solution not security people network people to decide where something should be routed how it should be routed 
The problem is it's never really isolated. And then with that cash loan mo, I, I said it on the last slide, this doesn't truly work because we don't have all of our marbles in one location. Our data is sitting in thousands or tens of thousands of locations now. We can't rely on connecting somebody to our corporate network to give them access to our data, whether that be physically connected, because they're going to be in our office, in our corporate office, whether it be virtually connected them, we can't rely on backhauling or bringing everything back to one central location to then say, who are you? Are you supposed to have access to this data? It doesn't work that way. And I don't know that it ever did. And the other thing that seemed fantastic, but no longer really is, is the concept of VPN or virtual private networks. I, early on in my career, probably the first seven, 10 years of my career, I was on call. I was on call a lot. And I got called a lot. At two o'clock in the morning, I would have to wake up, drive 30 minutes in the office, troubleshoot something for 30 minutes, and then drive 30 minutes home. And then I'd get to get back to bed for a couple of hours before going back in. So when VPN came out and I was able to connect to that, that remote network virtually and be connected to, to the network, it saved me a 30 minute drive in and out means I got more rest. So I loved VPN back in the day. The problem with VPN today is it connects you to that network. And then I get full access to the network because I'm literally on the network. And for employees, that's one thing. But with third parties that are connecting with unknown, untrusted, unmanaged devices, that is a scary, scary proposition for me as a CISO. So again, there are different risks that come with some of our legacy technology that's out there. I mentioned a couple of slides ago that we built technology based in stacks and everything. And I really wanted to show on this slide that stacking that technology really leads to inefficiencies. It leads to poor performance. And it even, as we're backhauling data and bringing everything back to one central point so we can inspect it, so we get visibility, so we know what in the world our people are doing, we're gonna add additional latency. They're gonna, it's gonna add frustration. What we really need to do is to put our controls where our data is, or as close to the data as possible, or as close to where our users are at to reduce that latency as well. If we're adopting and we're being cloud first organizations, we need solutions that are going to be born, bred, deployed in the cloud as well. So once again, we don't need to put these technology stacks that are out there hoping and praying that they're gonna work for us when they're sitting at our corporate locations that our users are never really touching anymore. That's why I'm saying these are no longer working for us. And then why doesn't that work anymore? You know, because first and foremost, as the slide says, our data doesn't sit on-prem anymore. Secure perimeters and VPNs, they're not sufficient. I don't think it's earth shattering for any IT professional to think, that bringing all data back to one central location is not going to work. It's not sufficient. The problem is we still have mindset issues to overcome. As I go and present in front of board of directors and I start talking about even that old technology stack that's there, and I'm talking about building defense in depth, the board members look at me like I'm crazy. They say, we've got a firewall. Why do we need anything else? It's so ingrained in our executives that a firewall is going to protect them from cyber criminals. If that's our executive, imagine just how ingrained we, the security professionals, are on these old school technologies that, that are there. We, too, need to shift our mindsets, whether it's the, the network team getting away from joining people to networks, whether it's the security teams with we love our firewalls. We love our you know, next generation firewalls, web application firewalls, our SSL decryption. We love our technology. We love a new toy that we get to play with. But the reality is we've got to start letting go of some of those ways of doing. The reasons are these legacy solutions, they're not really working for us. We need to move ahead. We need to change and look at the different landscapes and the digital transformations that are coming. It wasn't just in 2020 with COVID that this was forced on us. This is a journey we have been on for a while. 
So what is this journey? I believe that the journey, the future of securing organizations is going to be a journey towards zero trust. I have spent decades building security programs based on the old technology stacks. I don't think that is going to be our future. The zero trust methodology is a complete change. We will be shifting technology. We've already started to see some of that change. And change, we all know that change is hard. But we start with a change in mindset. No longer do you connect people to a network. We are now really looking at this principle of least privilege, and we're connecting a person just to an application, what they're authorized to be able to connect to. We don't connect them to a network. Yes, I'm saying that yet again. So network teams don't focus on network connectivity. Security teams will need to define granular policies. It's going to be a fundamental change. It's going to take a lot of rethinking in order to understand, but we need to realize it's what's best for the organizations. So forgetting what I've always done it this way and embracing, changing, and adapting. Because if we don't change, if we don't adapt, we're not going to best protect our organizations and we're going to get left behind. Uh, I know the slide says how I started the journey. I'm going to get into that right on this next slide now, because I really want to introduce what I really mean when I'm saying zero trust. So when I'm talking zero trust, there are really four principles or tenets to zero trust that I want to talk about. The first and foremost is trust but verify, or I guess don't trust at all until after you verify, but this assume compromise first and foremost. We don't trust just because you're physically there. We don't trust just because you are who you say you are. And this, this principle of assume compromise has been communicated for years at this point. And I really want to say, if our technology stacks, if our defense in depth really was working for us, we wouldn't have had this assume compromise tenant or principle or all of us you know, walking around saying, if we just assume that our networks are compromised and now we just have to find it. If our principles worked, if our technologies worked, we wouldn't have had to have this assumed compromise. That again tells me that our controls, our, our processes, they just have not been as effective as they should have been. The second principle in zero trust is gonna come down to who are you and what should you have access to? So authentication and authorization is going to be that second pillar. We need to know who somebody is beyond a shadow of a doubt who they are. And then what do they need to do their job, to do their function? We're not just going to connect people to a network and say, here you go. We're going to say, who are you? And should you be a access in this application? Should you be accessed in this file share or not? And after that, need to realize to reduce our attack surface because cyber criminals are out there scanning the, the internet. They're looking for ways to get into our organization. We really need to reduce that attack surface. So our applications and our workloads, they really should be invisible to the internet. So despite uh, anything else going on, application segmentation needs to be put in place to reduce that attack. That, that attack surface, you should not be able to see any of my servers listening on RDP, on TCP port 3389. That should not be listening from the internet. None of my services should be listening from the internet, removing and reducing that, that attack surface. And by doing those things, I really believe that we can give our end users a consistent user experience. Our employees are begging for a consistent experience we're not going to trust based on location. We're not going to give them access based on the device that they're coming from, but we want to give them a consistent, no matter where they're at, no matter where they're coming from, what device or anything, they're going to have the same type of interaction despite all of those things that are out there. But I really want to touch on zero trust. Zero trust is not a single product. No one vendor will give you zero trust. Zero trust is an enterprise-wide strategy. It is an enterprise vision that we all need to buy into. And then it is a mindset as well. That is what zero trust is. And this is what I started in the last couple of years, the journey that I went on. 
So how did I actually start it as well? First and foremost, I focused on identity. Who are you? How do I know? And I started with an identity provider, an IDP, rolling that out. And then I didn't want to just rely on usernames and passwords because any social engineer that asks somebody, hey, who are you? Yeah, if that email is good enough, if that social engineer is good enough, they're just going to give it away. So then I had to enable 2FA or multi-factor authentication. And then very, very easily, I started saying, what do you need access to? And this is where groups came from. Whether you're using you know, a third-party solution, whether you're using Active Directory to do this, we really need to look at the principle of least privilege and start assigning roles, start assigning access based on what that person needs access to. Uh, it started very, very high level. HR, engineering, IT, finance, that sort of thing. And said, if you're in HR, you get access to HR files. If you're in engineering, you get access to engineering tools, applications, and files. Uh, then we went to geography as well. If you're in North America, you get access to North America HR folders. If you're in South America, you don't need access to North America HR folders. Yes, you're in HR. And we just started making it more and more granular as we went down. And then we went into monitor mode of what are people actually accessing? Because when we went and said, what do you need access to? These are the websites we need uh, access to. We went to finance. What do you need access to? And they gave us a list of, of things. Had we just said, these are the things they need access to, we would have royally messed things up. Because at the last day of the month, my finance team would be accessing tax sites or financial institutions. They access it one day of the month, but they're critical. They've got to file that paperwork. That wasn't included in the list when I asked my finance team what they need access to. So you're going to have to really sit there, monitor what accesses are, are truly needed over a period of time. This is not something where you can flip a light switch and say, now I know. This is going to be a journey. It's going to be multi-steps or multi-phases here. So I started with identity, with auth authentications and authorizations. And then the next thing I did when I started on my journey to zero trust was break connections to my network. This too was a journey. I wanted my third parties to stop utilizing VPN because it brought unmanaged, untrusted, unknown devices to my network, and then they could pivot anywhere they wanted to. If they brought an infected machine and connected it to my network, they can pass that malware throughout my network as well. So I started by removing the VPN client from them, removing them from that group. They can no longer use it. And I gave them VDI, or virtual desktop instance. Yes, they could still connect to that machine and then hop anywhere else in the network, but unmanaged and untrusted devices were no longer connecting to my network. And then I could disable their accounts when I wanted to. I took away local admin rights. They could no longer just click on things. And my security controls were on those systems that they're connecting to. And I use non-persistent ones as well. So they didn't sit there, you know, racking up costs as well. So I was able to control costs there as well. So it really started a journey. Those are some of the quick wins that I got in my own organization that I was then able to go to my executives and say, now I want to roll this out to employees. Now I want to have this consistent user experience throughout. And because I had some of those quick wins, they were able to trust me and allow me to take the next steps on that on that digital journey or the, the journey towards zero trust as well. So again, how does this work? We stop allowing people to connect to our network. No longer do we connect systems to our network. We connect users to applications. And we're only going to connect that user to that application, not just because they say, I want to connect, but we identify them. Then we look at authorizations. Who are they? What system are they coming from? Does it pass our you know, posture control? If the answer is yes and they're authorized, then we're going to connect them to the application. We are really following this principle of least privilege. It's not an inherent trust. Yes, zero trust, you will still be trusting things. So it's not truly zero trust. You're, you're trusting your identity provider. You're trusting this access broker. You're trusting the things that you control now. 
but it really follows this principle of least privilege and is as granular a policy as you make it. I said I wanted to go through some of these principles of uh, ransomware, but we are already over time on that. So I'm going to jump into my summary now and say our threats really have evolved. The attackers, they have evolved. They're keeping up. We, the defenders, the guardians, we need to keep up with the technology changes. We've got to adapt. If we don't adapt, our organizations will suffer. We've got to stop allowing people to connect to our networks. Now we connect them to applications. Stop trying to fight today and tomorrow's battles using yesteryear's technologies. Thank you so much for your time. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, please drop me a note. I am happy to carry on and continue the conversation.